This is a CBC News special presentation. It's expensive for like young people to live. If we wanted to own our own house, we can. You tell us over and over again. I can't even think about purchasing a home. Rent, high grocery prices. And the wages are the same. <laughs> The cost of living in this country is sky high. Rent's been way too high, it's insane. Things that were concerning, but now it's alarming. Facing dismal polling numbers and tough criticism. <laughs> the Liberals went on the offensive with weeks of pre-budget announcements. Billions in programs they say will make life more affordable. We're focused on fairness. I'd like for them to keep the cost of food down and to keep the cost of fuel down. High to pay wage. Yeah, I mean, it's only right since everything else is going up. Carbon tax. That's just another tax. We have enough taxes. Today, we find out what they haven't yet announced, how it's all being paid for, and what it means for you, your country, and your money. This is special coverage of Budget Day. Hello, I'm Rosemary Barton. Let's take you right now inside the House of Commons where the Finance Minister is beginning to deliver special coverage of Budget 2024. With that, the budget has been tabled, which means that the finance minister will begin speaking, and we can we tell you a little bit more about what is inside for, for the past couple generation. of weeks. to announce and how they're going to pay for it all. We'll dip back into the speech from the finance minister in just a few moments. But first, let's go to David Cochran, who was inside the lockup all day today to give us a sense of what else we need to know, David. Well, Rosie, so much of this has already been announced in advance. This is the eighth budget under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, and in classic style for this government, there is a lot of new spending. In fact, there's $52.9 billion in new spending over the next five Five years. That is the total value of the package that has been unveiled in this particular budget. But we, uh, they are able to do this new spending, uh, the $52.9 billion, but still able to keep their debt and deficit targets broadly in line with the measures they set for themselves in the fall economic statement. And that's largely because of two significant things. They have more wiggle room. Part of that wiggle room comes from tax increases that are coming in this budget. There are higher capital gains taxes in this budget affecting the wealthiest 0.13% of Canadians and, and large corporations in this country. It's not an increase in the rates, Rosie. It's an increase in what's called the inclusion rate. Right now, if you make money on a capital gains, you're only taxed on 50% of the profit you make. That's going to increase to 66% of the profit will be included in the capital gains uh, taxation calculation. For individuals, that's only on profits you make in excess of $250,000 a year. So that's why it, this increase only affects such a small uh, segment of the population. But for companies, it's baseline. So that's going to be a challenge. We can talk more about that later in the show. The other big thing is that there's an improving economy, which equals higher revenues. There was a lot of turbulence economically over the past year, but the government has gotten that soft landing it was looking for. It avoided a recession. And if you look at the numbers, tax revenues from income tax and other measures are up right across the board. So, on to the deficit numbers that I mentioned. You can see there are still large deficits in this budget, right around the $40 billion mark. That's the ceiling they set for themselves in the fall economic statement last year. They come in just at that number for the year just ended, stay just below it in future years, and you see an increase in the deficits in, in the out years. No plan for a balanced budget. This is an attempt by Christian Freeland to sort of ba balance uh, what she considers to be fiscal restraint with the screaming needs uh, of an angry and anxious Canada right now. And so on that, the big focus of this budget, Rosie, is housing. There's been a string of announcements leading up to this with the release of a strategic uh, housing strategy on Friday. There's $23 billion in total spending in this budget. $8 billion of that is spending that goes on the bottom line. The rest is $15 billion in loans to help uh, companies get access to capital, to help finance uh, construction for apartments and rental properties and infrastructure. Uh, so that doesn't get booked to the debt, though, to, sorry, to the deficit, but it is something the government has to account for. 
more. And, and one of the things that's in this uh, budget too, Rosie, that we can talk about uh, a bit on is some specifics on the federal lands they want to convert into housing and apartment, Canada Post properties, national defense properties, surplus lands here in Ottawa. The other pillar that they want to focus on in this budget is uh, economic growth and productivity. Uh, two things to point to on this. A new electric vehicle supply chain tax credit, a, uh, continuing with this offering investment tax credits for companies to invest. This is not just to open up a plant, it's to open a plant, a battery plant, and a cathode plant, all three layers of the, of the manufacturing chain uh, for electric vehicles to, to juice the economy and the carbon rebate for small businesses that they've been waiting on since 2019. There's a promise of measures in this budget to return two and a half billion dollars to 600,000 small businesses starting later this year after they file their taxes. So there's going to be some pushback from business groups on the capital gains uh, increases, but broadly not a massive spending new budget. 52.9 billion over uh, five years is about 1% so uh, of total GDP. let me ask two GDP. things that I've been talking about all day yeah. while you're in the lockup. Either the windfall tax or the new tax bracket for high income earners. Not there. Not the there. only tax changes to the negative is this capital gains inclusion rate tax. Uh, there's also some changes to capital gains uh, for the better. Uh, the lifetime exemption for if you sell a, a firm, a, a fishing enterprise, or a small business, that's going from $1 million to by one, either 1.25 or 1.3 going from memory. There's a new entrepreneur tax credit uh, that is designed to encourage startups and scale-ups uh, you know, to make that more lucrative for them as they grow their business and, and maybe flip it or, or whatever. But the only tax increases Despite all the predictions, the base uh, corporate tax rate doesn't change. It's strictly on capital gains, and that is going to be an issue for the business community. Uh, and one last question before we dip maybe back in to hear from the finance minister. The, the, just go back to where the windfall is and how much it, how much they have to play with here that we weren't expecting. Something like $3 billion or, or well, something. It, in, it's at it's kind of yeah, even more than that. Like if, if you break it down, the, the amount of money, like income tax, is up $7.7 .7 billion. Because if you remember Budget Day a year ago, Rosie, like sort of the consensus amongst economists is we are headed to a recession if we're not already in it. There was no recession. They avoided it. And now economic growth is largely to the positive. Uh, there is some suggestion that, you know, the, 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 the forecasting they use is a, is a, is a consensus of, of private sector economists. It's not government numbers. Um, you know, you're looking at growth anywhere from like 0.7 to 1.5%, depending on the modeling you look at. But uh, it, it, all of that has led to an increase uh, in revenue. But they spent all of that and they raised capital gains tax and they spent all of that too. So it goes beyond just using the windfall. They've created a windfall through tax increases that they're pouring into these programs. Okay, let's go to someone who was looking for that windfall tax for excess profits. That's NDP leader Judd Meek said. Let's listen in live. Give you a quick sec. You're all in position. Okay. There are some things in this budget that we fought for, that we spent time hearing from Canadians, and we forced this government to deliver. Those include protections for renters. When renters live in constant fear that they're going to get rent evicted or kicked out of their homes because large corporate landlords want to buy those buildings and then evict them. We forced this government to put in place a renter's protection fund, something that we've been calling for for over a year. And that's going to help people stay in their homes and keep some of those affordable units affordable. We fought to force this government to bring in some relief for, for parents and kids so the kids when they go to school can get a nutritious meal with the National School Food Program. That's going to give some relief to parents. It's going to take one thing off their plate, save them money. We also forced this government to move forward on covering free birth control, free diabetes medication and devices. That's going to save thousands of dollars for millions of Canadians. We force this government to bring down the cost for Canadians. That's some relief in a time when Canadians are really feeling squeezed. We force this government to deliver that. And let's be absolutely clear, this would have never happened but for the fact New Democrats forced the Liberals to give this relief to Canadians, to give a bit of a break to Canadians. Uh, there are some concerns, though. We are, we're concerned about the fact that the Liberals uh, ignored the opportunity to take on corporate greed. We know the major driver that is driving up the cost of living is corporate greed. When it comes to buying groceries and you're paying more than ever before, that's corporate greed. When you're paying some of the highest cell phone and internet fees in the world, that's corporate greed, driving up the cost of your cell phone and internet fees. When you look at trying to find a home and speculators keep on driving up the cost of housing and corporate landlords are, are scooping up all the available housing, that is corporate greed that's making it harder for people to find a home. That is a major problem that makes life unaffordable and the Liberals failed to use the opportunity they had to take on corporate greed. 
But let's also be clear about the conservatives. The conservatives want to take this all away from you. They want to take away childcare. They've been open about that. Pierre Polyev wants to take away childcare. He wants to take away dental care from seniors, even though he's had it for most of his adult life paid for by taxpayers. He wants to take that away from seniors. He wants to take away pharmacare from people that need that extra support. He wants to take that away, and he wants to cut further. He wants to cut health care. He wants to cut pensions. He wants to cut EI. He is going to make things even worse for Canadians. But there are some concerns we have in this budget as well, and I want to lay out some of those concerns we have. We're concerned about the disability benefit that we fought for being only $200 a month. That is far too little to, to meet the needs of people living with disabilities. We're concerned that this government has not laid out the plan to address the gap in infrastructure and housing funding for Indigenous communities. That's a serious concern. We're concerned about the loss of 5,000 public sector employees. Serious concern as well. So we've got some, some serious concerns in this budget. Um, there's things that we fought for, and, uh, and we're going to continue to use our power as we have throughout this minority government to fight for Canadians to make Ottawa... Okay, and that is NDP leader Jagmeet Singh talking about some of the things that were in the budget and some of the things that he would have liked to see, but also there at the end, as you heard, saying that he'll continue to use his influence to try and get the government to do more things under the Supply and Confidence Agreement. Uh, David, let's come back to you a little bit sure. to talk about other things that they, I'll let you decide what you want to talk about now, well, frankly. Uh, look, yeah. the, the, there's a lot there. Um, one of the things that we have to point out, because this is going to be, I think, something we're going to hear from uh, the Conservatives when, when they speak to this, and that is what is happening with the state of the finances overall. So look, I mentioned that the deficit is going to stay broadly in line with what the government uh, talked about. We showed the numbers there. It's hovering around $40 billion. In the years yeah. that we have yeah. clear financial spending yeah. for, it's lower in the out years, but we just don't know what they're going to do or the next government is going to do in those years. But a number to watch is the public debt charges. Rosie, right now, we are spending, at the year just ended as a country, $47.2 billion on the interest. In the current year, in this budget that's being projected, it's $54.5 billion. That's more than the federal government transfers to the provinces for health care. It's over 10% of every dollar they take in. 10 cents of every dollar is going to service the debt. And by 2028, 2029, with no new spending beyond what is there, and that includes a whole bunch of things we want to do in defense, for example, to get closer to that NATO 2% target, the government of Canada is going to be spending $64 billion a year in interest on the debt. You know, before the pandemic, it was like $30 billion. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is the result of what has happened because of the, the debt they took on uh, during the pandemic to avoid downloading it all to the provinces. But some of it is just a natural increase of the expansion of the size of the state. Program expenses right now are half a trillion dollars. We're just below $500 billion at $480 billion for the year ahead, going up to uh, $496 billion. So the size of government has grown. The size of the debt has grown. The size of the debt charges yes. have grown yes. while they're rolling Rolling out pharmacare, child care, dental care, programs, and an ambitious yeah. housing yeah. plan. If you want to watch the full speech by Christia Freeland inside the House of Commons, you can do that on our website, cbc.ca. Our politics site particularly will have it easily for you. We'll bring up a bit of her as we continue to uh, talk about what's in the budget. Uh, and if you have any questions about what's in the budget, you can go to send us an email, ask at cbc.ca. We'll do our best to answer them today and in the days ahead. We want to know what you think about what you're hearing so far. With that, let's bring in Jimmy John. He is the vice president, chief economist, and strategist for the Desjardins Group, and he was inside the lockup all day as well. Jimmy John, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So I, I, I want you to give me a sense of where you see the economy going, given what was presented today. Well, uh, what you see uh, in today's announcement uh, hinges a lot on uh, revenue assumptions uh, that rely on strong GDP growth. So uh, you see how uh, the strong, stronger than expected GDP growth uh, brings in that uh, uplift in, in revenues in uh, 23, 24, 9 billion. It's expected to be 36 billion more in revenues over the uh, horizon. However, having said that, uh, it seems that the government assumes that uh, the soft landing is a foregone conclusion. I wouldn't be so sure because we have an unemployment rate that just jumped to 6.1 percent. Uh, the other thing as well is that uh, we rely heavily on tax collections uh, that we don't know for sure how much we'll be able to uh, collect. At least uh, historically, uh, there tended to be disappointment on that front. So there's still a lot of hope in that budget, I would say. The other thing being that the uh, the uh, 
uh, growth assumptions don't factor in the non-permanent resident admissions uh, cutbacks that were announced. Uh, we know that uh, immigration is the reason why Canada avoided a recession last year. There's that to consider as well. One of the things that we've been talking about here with, with David is the um, increase on the taxes on capital gains. And of course the fear there for anyone when, when that gets suggested is that people just start pulling investment or real estate out of the country. How, how comfortable are you with what seems to be an ambitious uh, increase to the tax? Very ambitious uh, indeed. We're talking 19 billion, so it's no insignificant amount. And as you mentioned, we're uh, targeting the taxpayers that are the most uh, mobile in terms of their, their wealth, uh, in terms of their incomes, uh, wealthy individuals, uh, highly sophisticated investors that, uh, you know, uh, an accountant is just a phone call away and they uh, optimizing their taxes is, is what they do. So uh, this is why those kinds of uh, revenue raising measures have tended to disappoint uh, in the past. Let's see if they're better at uh, targeting uh, tax uh, evasion, tax avoidance or optimization. But uh, it's still, you know, we, we, we have to, it's still a leap of faith, I would say. Sure. And in the meantime, it does send as well uh, a negative signal for the, uh, you know, high income, uh, very talented individuals that Canada needs to pursue uh, innovation, the innovation agenda, productivity, R&D, and those kind of things. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And just so people understand, capital gains tax are, are taxes applied when you sell stocks, bonds, real estate, those kinds of things. And it's usually because you've got a, you've got a lot of invested in those different things. Um, Jimmy John, you had previously, before the budget, worried, I think, a little bit about how increased spending could contribute to inflation. We saw inflation tick up just a little bit uh, today. What are your concerns now after seeing how big the spend is? Well, I, I think uh, I'm less worried about that now than I was uh, maybe two years ago. The reason being that, uh, at least according to the Bank of Canada, we're in a state of excess capacity uh, in the economy. So uh, two years ago, we were in excess demand. So any uh, added uh, government spending, and especially checks to households, would get spent and fuel inflation quite directly. Now, it's a bit of a different story. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a dollar is a dollar. And you know, even if uh, you're looking at uh, building more more uh, housing uh, in order to reduce shelter inflation down the road. Uh, in the meantime, you still need more workers, you need still need more materials, and you might be bumping against uh, some constraints. But it's more a question as to you know whether we have to think about inflation being uh, at 2% or 3%. It's not a question of whether we're going back to 8%. For sure. Last question, Jimmy John. Is there something in the budget here that you find uh, will make a big difference when it comes to the issue of productivity, which I know is something economists like to talk about and are concerned about right now? Is there anything here that would make a difference on that front? Well, that's the uh, the disappointment on my end. We haven't heard in the lead up to the budget. Uh, we haven't heard uh, any measure that uh, really uh, provided much enthusiasm as it comes to uh, productivity, uh, as a, uh, as it comes to you know moving the needle. Uh, yes, you have the incentive tax credits in electric vehicles. We those had been announced already. At least we get a little bit more clarity on those. Uh, but uh, much more needs to be done on uh, investment and productivity. And I'm just concerned that the capital gains uh, announcement will be taken as a negative signal as to what the government wants to happen in Canada by way of productivity and uh, investment. So I think it was light on that front, and, uh, but uh, this is the foundation for pretty much everything else that this budget relies on. Jimmy John, always wonderful to have your uh, analysis and your smarts. Thank you so much for making the time. Pleasure, thank you. Okay. Uh, as we were talking, Jagmeet Singh uh, has come out uh, over the to, to talk about what he did not get in the budget. Obviously, his uh, party was looking for a windfall tax, a way to get excess profits from corporations. Was also looking for action on the disability tax credit, which uh, I'll get David to mention in just a moment. Uh, he was asked whether he would support the budget, and he said that it was not the time to, to talk about that right now. Mm -hmm. However, they are in a supply and confidence agreement uh, with the Liberals and have supported them in the past. Um, so I'm not sure what he's suggesting there, David. I mean, he can pull out of the agreement anytime he wants, I suppose, but yeah. um, there is sort of a tacit, uh, we'll tell you this if you tell us that, and, and so they, we expect it to do it. They've also agreed in yeah. that agreement to support the government in any confidence yes. votes, and the budget yes. 
it's a, a confidence, confidence vote so, because so, it's a financial plan and the future uh, yes. of the government. Perhaps so he, he dancing vote for around that. a little bit on, on what he's suggesting he'll do, but, but that is what the agreement um, says. On the disability benefit, yeah. do you want to just go over what is not there and what maybe we were expecting? Right, so this is something Jagmeet Singh mentioned, and it's something we've been getting questions about on budget day and fall economic yeah. statements for years going back, that the government has promised to do something on this. The level of supports for people with disabilities is seen as too low in the country. And they did pass legislation promising to create a disability, a Canada disability benefit. Benefit. The details are in this budget. You're probably going to be disappointed if you listen to what the experts said was needed for this. So budget 2024 proposes funding of $6.1 billion over six years. Starting this year, but payments would not start until July of 2025. The maximum amount an individual could get under this is $200 a month. So it's important to note that when you break this down on an annual basis, it's about a billion dollars a year. I spoke to Neil Hetherington from the Daily Bread Food Bank, uh, which is a massive operation in Toronto that serves a lot of people and is part of a coalition of people who have been advocating for an increase in the disability uh, 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 benefit. They estimate, Rosie, that to get people up to basically a living standard, the federal government needed to put 10 to $12 billion every year into this program. It's $1 billion, rising to about 1.4. So in terms of ambition and range, it's about 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, for what was wanted. There's some rationale for that in here, that essentially this builds on a bunch of existing benefits that are there. Um, there are concerns uh, at the federal level. I know from speaking with people, Rosemary, is that if the federal government came in in a big way, provinces might pull back and people who get the benefit might not actually be any better off. But it also, I think, ties back to the desire of this government to stay within those fiscal targets they set for the deficit of $40 billion, no more than 1% of GDP, in out years, a declining debt to GDP ratio over time. 10 to 12 billion dollars for yet another program expansion that is broadly provincial jurisdiction didn't fit into the plan so there there is a, a program there but it falls well short of what advocates were looking for well, and that, that is actually one of the issues that i get emailed about a yeah. lot as well so obviously i know there was a lot of anticipation around what would be there and we'll let people uh, judge for themselves but but certainly not i think what everyone was asking for if you do have a question though for us you can email us ask at cbc.ca if we don't answer it here right now in the next 30 minutes we'll certainly try and answer it over the next number of days Let's listen to uh, Finance Minister Christia Freeland inside the House right now talking more about what she's delivered today. More affordable to go to college and university by renewing the increase in upfront Canada student grants and interest free loans, increasing the amount of financial aid students get for housing, and making it easier for mature students to go back to school affordably. And all of this is on top of our campaign promise to eliminate interest on Canada student loans, which we delivered on a year ago. Our new Canadian Entrepreneurs Incentive will ensure entrepreneurs get to keep a bigger share of the profits from the risks they take and the hard work they do and have more money to reinvest into their next venture. A prosperous future and abundant, good-paying jobs depend on Canada's innovators, entrepreneurs and researchers. And this is why we are supporting them. Mr. Speaker, there are those who claim that the only good thing government can do when it comes to economic growth is to get out of the way. That's why you sit there, guys. That's why they sit there. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce those people those people who just cheered to the talented trades people and the brilliant engineers who last Thursday made the final weld. It's known as the Golden Weld on a great national project, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yep. Mr. Speaker. 
Speaker, it took an activist, determined liberal government to get it built. And last week, the Bank of Canada estimated that this project alone will add one quarter of percentage point to Canada's wow. GDP. for the benefit of our younger generations and those who love them. We continue to stick to a responsible fiscal plan. As part of that plan, in the fall, we set three very specific fiscal guideposts. Maintaining the 2023-24 deficit at or below $40.1 billion lowering the debt to gdp ratio in 2024-25 relative to the 2023 fall economic statement and keeping it on a declining track thereafter and maintaining a declining deficit to gdp ratio in 2024-25 and keeping deficits below one percent of gdp in 2026-27 and future years mr speaker in this budget, every single... One okay, that's a little bit more of Finance Minister Christy Freeland inside the House of Commons getting a lot of laughs from Conservative benches when she mentioned that the best way for governments to create economic growth is to get out of the way, which is something Conservatives deeply believe and don't think the Liberals are doing. So lots of laughs there from the bench. If you want to watch more of that speech as it unfolds, cbc.ca is the place to do that. And we'll standing by, obviously, to hear from Pierre Poiliev, who will respond inside the House of Commons. We'll bring that to you live. But first, let's go to someone who, like you, has been listening in, Bryn Sinclair Waters. She's a mom renting in Toronto and, like a lot of Canadians, hoping to be able to buy her first home and has been listening probably not only today, Bryn, but through the past couple of weeks to see if there are things there that could help you and your family. Um, tell, tell me what your situation is now. You're renting now in Toronto, which, from what I understand, is not a great place to be renting. But tell me a little bit about what's going on for you. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. So I have an 11 month old baby and a huge priority for my partner and I and our family is to have an affordable, secure place to live. And right now as renters, we, we don't feel secure. Uh, we worry uh, the lack of rent control means rents just keep going up and up and up. Um, and we worry that if our landlord sells, uh, we may have to move. Uh, this happened to us two years ago. Uh, we had been in our place for seven years. Then we had to um, move when the house was being sold. Uh, we, we were able to find a place in the same neighborhood, but our rent almost doubled. And now if we look at the same units that we're living in now, in just two years, rents are already up 20 to 30 percent for the same the same unit that we're living in. Um, so for us, we're, we've been it's really been it's great to hear the government talk so much about tenant protections in the last couple of weeks. But I think I've been renting now. I'm in my 30s for like around 15 years and things just keep getting worse. So it, we really need to see some bold action now. Um, so that's what I'm looking for in this budget is um, some action on investments in public housing um, and doing something about the lack of rent control in, in our communities as well. What about buying a house? Because there's lots of measures that have been announced over the past Absolutely. little while for that too. Is, the, is there anything there that, that you could see that would make it maybe more possible for you? I think, so first of all, I wanted to say that right now for us, without rent controls in place, without access to public housing, because there's just too little of it, buying and home ownership really does feel like the only path to housing security. But it shouldn't be the only path. Like I think in some ways my partner and I would be so happy to be renters if we felt secure in, in renting, if it was affordable to rent in this city. Um, but yes, there are measures um, targeted at first time home buyers, which um, we have been, we do because of the context, spend a lot of time thinking about what it would take to buy. Yeah. It's discouraging because to this point we, we can't afford it. And I think when I see these measures, unfortunately it's, it seems to me that most of it is setting me up to extend myself further to buy my first home. And I don't see that as a path to housing security either. Um, and so I think it really does come back to like what I'd really want to see is this government invest money in 
in public housing because yeah. I also see a lot of money going to developers too in the way that we're incentivizing housing to get built. Um, yeah, so that's 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 the situation that we're in right now. We actually yeah. have a lot of housing being built, which is great. But yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily going to end up being affordable. And a lot of it might be investor owned, um, which is tricky because for someone like me, housing is not an investment, right? And that's for most people. It's not an investment. It's a place to live. Yeah. I, you know, I think just thinking through the things that we've heard over the past number of weeks, the public lands thing might be an option because then they're, you're, you're leasing lands to developers, but there will be conditions around what you can build there. So you could see how maybe that falls into the kind of thing that, that you're looking for. Uh, but I did want to touch on one more thing with you before I let you go, and that's that you don't have a $10 a day spot for your, for your kid either, for your 11 month old. And that's a key issue. And just to sure. go back on the, the public lands piece, and the, the I think the federal government does have a role in leadership, like you pointed out, right? It's like in the past, in the 70s, they actually put pressure on the provinces to bring in rent regulation. It would yeah. be great if there was funding and land use that they would say, like, if you're going to, if we're going to use public lands, then there's got to be affordable units on those lands. Um, and childcare, huge issue. Like, we're on 14 wait lists right now, um, nice. and we don't have a space yet. I will say, though, the fee reductions we've seen, because of the investments that the federal government's making in child care is massive in terms of affordability. But now what we need is spaces. We need to see yeah. that collaboration with the federal government to make sure that there's spaces in my community so that we don't have to be stressed right down to the wire and calling, constantly checking in just to get that spot. Um, yeah. And to yeah. me, I think that means a lot of investments also in like the workers who are doing that work too, so that they can see a good job because those are my neighbors too, right? It's like people who can't afford sure. to live are also the people who um, are taking care of my kids and, and need a good wage to be able to stay in that yeah. profession. Yeah. So. And some of that some of that too was announced, but we'll see. It d takes some time to get all these things in place and, and you know, <laughs> you're, you need that space now rather than a year from now. So uh, Bryn Sinclair Waters, thank you. You're the perfect person to talk to. Lots of smart thoughts there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rosie. It's great to okay. be here. Nice to meet you. Appreciate it very much. A couple of indications of, of what is important in the budget is if you just look at some of the words that are featured in the budget. Certainly, we've been hearing a lot about fairness from the government over the past couple of weeks. Well, that was mentioned a whole lot, as was affordability, um, housing, renters, um, indigenous issues, younger people, Gen Z, millennials, all the words that you would expect in a, in a budget that is very targeted to a certain part of the Canadian population, people trying to get affordable housing, buy homes, get rentals, and people who feel the squeeze perhaps more than others. The other reason that cohort has been targeted by the government is because they believe that is a group of voters that they can get back. And that is, of course, part of what this document is also about. I'm going to go to David and then in a moment bring you to Yves-François Blanchet, the leader of the Bloc Québécois. David. Well, well, Bryn spoke on, on some of the issues that, that exist in, in what the government has announced over the past number of years uh, on child care, for example. Yeah. It, it's The aspiration is one thing, the execution is another, and so much of it depends on work done at the provincial level, and it's a similar thing with housing, right? So much of that depends on provincial governments and municipal governments uh, approving things, and also the labor supply is going to be a considerable constraint on the construction. But we have some more details just on what, uh, how the, the big housing strategy sure. announced on Friday is going to roll out. And, and, and in particular, I just want to highlight what they've announced in terms of using uh, government-owned lands. They, they, their plan is to unlock up to 50% of government office buildings over 10 years to turn it into housing. Now, so I didn't with, realize that it would include offices, not just right. a piece of land. It's a building that could be there already. Exactly. Yeah. So like some of the government buildings here in the downtown core, Doug Ford was here not that long ago with, 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 with the mayor of Ottawa saying it's time for people to come back to work to help the downtown core. Remote work is more of a reality for office jobs. You have surplus capacity, convert those into apartments. But also... If you've ever dreamed of living above a Canada Post, well, this government has a plan for you. Uh, you, you have the, the post office, you have the Department of yeah, National Defense. They own property across Canada, a lot of which is underused. And they aren't just putting this out there as an idea. There are specific properties in this budget that they say could be turned into something. So in terms of national defense, the Amherst Armory in Amherst, Nova Scotia, the National Defense Medical Center here in Ottawa, these are being looked at as possible uh, housing developments. You know, if you live near the uh, the Hardin Street Canada Post in Fort McMurray, Alberta, that has been listed for sale. So there are properties here because the question has been, you have the ideas, you have the plan, 
How are you going to do it quickly enough that people can see progress? They've identified some inventory. They've, they've, they've mandated their departments to look at the land they own, the property they own, identify things that would be suitable for housing, and, and maybe get, be prepared to put it onto the market through some sort of arrangement, either through the lease that has been talked about or a flat-out sale, and have that confer, con converted into housing, some of which would have a component of affordability as a requirement of getting in there. But that could be done a lot faster than having to build a bunch of new things as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. conversions are tricky, and, and you know, and one of the big things too about this, Rosie, is like we, I know we've talked a lot about the federal government and the pressure they have on housing. Rent control is provincial, yes. so you yes. know there yes. is a when role for all rent. of yeah. the premiers yeah. to yeah. play on that particular issue, not just the federal government. Okay, David, thank you for that. Let's go now to the uh, leader of the Bloc Québécois, Yves François Blanchet, who's giving his reaction to what he has heard today. He needs to speak with the prime minister to see if he can get more concessions perhaps on taxing corporations. Do you have any concerns about the NDP not supporting the government, that the government could fall? I have no such concern. At the end of every episode of a series on Netflix, they say in the next part of this show, this is what will happen. We already know what will happen. Mr. Singh will come here and find an explanation for his keeping supporting the Liberals. Uh, Je, je n'ai aucun doute sur le fait I que have le NPD no doubt about the fact that the NDP will support libéraux. the Liberal je budget. Le bloc en alerte I don't think uh, we're painting my name on a bus just yet when it comes to uh, le, le an election. But we do know that the NDP will support uh, the budget. It's like uh, at the end of a series, they say this, uh, this is what to expect in the next episode. So Mr. Singh will come here and provide uh, a complex explanation as to why he will be supporting the Liberal government. Think of the cost of our debt right now. It, it's more than, it will be more than what our debt, Canada's oh, okay. debt. Um, it's going to be more than our health transfers. That's a spiral. The more you have to pay for the debt, the more you dig the debt deeper. And the more you have to pay for the debt. And it's, it's a cercle vicieux, which I don't know how to translate. So something should have been done, being more careful. The idea is not not to spend money, but there are some programs, some measures, which are necessary. But the problem is that every measure the government has put forward is an intrusion in the jurisdictions of Quebec and provinces. They should have spent less, they should have spent better, they should have stopped entirely any form of financial support to oil and gas industry, which does not need it, and we would have a much better budget. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Okay, that is the Bloc Québécois leader, Yves-François Blanchet, talking about some of his concerns. Uh, also saying that largely he, he, I believe, will not support the budget. Uh, he has some concerns around jurisdictional overreach uh, for, for one, uh, particularly around the housing issues, but I think those things will be discussed with the government of Quebec, so perhaps that will change. He also pointed out, rightly, as David was uh, pointing out to me during one of the moments, that the NDP's pattern on budgets has been to uh, not say whether they support the budget or not, and try to squeeze the cloth dry? Would that be a fair, just get a little, wring a little more out of the government? Yeah, I think, that, if I'm remembering correctly, Rosie, they did this with dental care. Remember, they wanted to see movement on dental, they wanted to see movement on pharmacare, they got a commitment on a legislative framework by pharmacare. And, and even though they, the supply and confidence agreement says that they will support them on confidence motions, you only have so many inflection points where you can manipulate the dominant partner in this agreement and the budget, the fall economic statement, key pieces of legislation, these are the moments. So the NDP, you know, while it has this leverage, is going to use it. Um, but you know, it's interesting with, with Mr. Singh, we do see him taking credit for all the good things that uh, uh, the government does as, as an NDP idea, while then lamenting all the terrible things that the government he continues to keep in power does as well. Right. Right? Yeah, D difficult position to be sure. Uh, so we're not going to read too much in, I think, to the NDP's position right now. Uh, things will play out over the days ahead. Uh, let's go back inside the House of Commons, where Christopher Freeland is wrapping up her speech, and then we will hear from the leader of the Conservative we will Party build of Canada. More homes. We will make life cost less. We will grow our economy in a way that works for everyone. Together, we will unlock the door to the middle class for more Canadians. 
and renew the promise of our great country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question and comment of the Honourable Chief of Opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This is the ninth deficitary budget since the Prime Minister promised that the books would balance themselves. And everything he's spending on has gotten worse. He promised that the deficits would make housing affordable, but it ended up doubling the cost of rent and mortgage payments and down payments to buy a house. He said that the cost of of food would be more affordable, and now it costs 30 percent more, and one in four children aren't able to get nutritious meals. After nine deficits, Mr. Speaker, the government is rich and the people are poor. And today, they're doing the same thing over again with $40 billion worth of inflationary deficit. That means $2,400 for each family in inflation and spending and uh, increase to the national debt instead of health. And that's why the Conservatives have a common sense plan to put an end to this pyro prime minister who's adding fuel to the flames. The ninth deficit after the prime minister promised the budget would balance itself. And what did he do with the money? Everything he spent on has become more expensive. He's doubled the rent, doubled mortgage payments, doubled the needed down payment for a home, forced 35 homeless encampments in Halifax alone. One in four kids cannot afford food. And now he's adding $40 billion of new debt and new spending. That's $2,400 of new inflation. That is why Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget that poor that is like a pyromaniac spraying gas on the inflationary fire that he lit it is getting too hot and too expensive for canadians and that's why we need a carbon tax election to replace him with a common sense conservative government Thank you. And that is the response from the Conservative leader, Pierre Poiliev. No surprise there. He's not going to support uh, this budget, saying that uh, it's like a pyromaniac putting gas on the fire uh, of inflation that he lit. Also saying that we need an election on the carbon tax. Of course, the carbon tax barely contributes to inflation at all. Uh, let's bring in the Ad Issue panel here for their first take. Chantal Hébert in Montreal, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, they're in the lockup in Ottawa. And before uh, we say anything, you'll all be back later tonight on The National. But this is just to get sort of your first reaction. Andrew, why don't I start with you? Uh, seems to focus a lot on, yes, big spending, also trying to find ways to create more revenue. What, what do you think the, the, the message is from this budget? Well, I mean, for all the air of political desperation that uh, surrounds it, uh, you know, with them at the, where they are in the polls, it's a strangely underwhelming document. I mean, there's, yes, there's the usual, you know, slew of new spending, another $11 billion a year just from the, the fall economic statement, which kind of makes you wonder why they issue those forecasts at all if they're so easily overtaken. But on the three big crises that are facing this country, I would say, one being the growth crisis, the second being the housing crisis, and the third being the international security crisis, uh, they just really seem to have come up short in all of them, particularly in the growth crisis. You would never know that we had such a serious problem with productivity and growth from this document. There's no measures in here to really stimulate investment in general and to, to stimulate competition, which will force businesses to use that investment more wisely. There's just the usual subsidies and tax credits and gimmicks for the particular favored sectors of the government, so artificial intelligence or clean technologies, et cetera. That is not going to move a $3 trillion economy in the way that it needs to be moved. 
the housing measures, some of them certainly sound very uh, intriguing, those that haven't been already you know, leaked in advance of the document. But I don't think anybody thinks that this is going to be enough to solve the crisis. And on defense, when you look at how serious the international security crisis is, is right now, when you've got this incipient alliance of these autocracies uh, pretty much going to war against the democracies, the amount of the, the, the increase in defense spending, so much of it in out years, not in immediate terms, mm -hmm again, just seems to come up short. So when you've got a government that has so hundreds of different priorities, I think this is what you run up against, is when you really need to focus your resources and your attention on a few big items, you're not able or not willing to do it. Okay, I'll go to Althea because she's, she's standing there right beside you, which is fun to see the two of you standing side by side. Althea, what, uh, what's your take so far on what you've uh, looked at I was going to say, Andrew, what about the debt? That wasn't that one of your well, bullet points? They managed to stay within their, de their, their deficit and debt targets just by increasing taxes, so good for them. Yeah, we, we know um, Andrew loves to talk debt. Go healthy. <laughs> well, I mean, Andrew calls it desperate. It's certainly an electoral budget, um, and it's very clear that they want Jagmeet Singh to support this budget. I mean, frankly, it could have been written by the NDP. I don't think it would have changed much. Uh, than what's actually in this budget, although maybe there would have been more generous uh, disability benefit payments because it's only $2,400 a year. Um, maybe there would have been a little less in terms of uh, the, the credits to the oil and gas industry to help them move towards a greener transition. But this is a, I don't see how Jagmeet Singh could be really unhappy with this budget. And for liberals who thought that Justin Trudeau's government had spent too much and was way too left wing, uh, this clearly you know the the lines are drawn for the next election campaign and this is a government that's going to be going after the NDP lunch clearly it thinks that that is the way uh, to survive or the way it thinks it can possibly win win government again um, and it you know this is a a field day, I think, for conservatives because it is so drastically to the left. Uh, there are a lot of proposals in this budget that uh, only come into effect uh, next year. So, like the disability benefit, for example, would only come be a, a payment in July. There's some goodies that some people may not be expecting, like uh, small businesses, for example, will get a whole bunch of money back uh, from the carbon price that they may not have been anticipating, but the government has been sitting on this money since 2019. And then there are programs that they uh, want to create that they haven't created yet, that they haven't even thought about the implementation. We hear the word propose and to launch and intention to introduce almost 300 times in this budget. So that's a lot of new program spending coming online. Um, and the big challenge, frankly, will be for the government to implement any yeah. of this stuff, because that has been a huge challenge so far. Uh, if they want these programs to be you know, sold to the public as like, oh, no, the big bad conservatives will take this away, well, first they have to be implemented. And I don't know how they're going to do all that. OK, Chantal, you're uh, in Montreal watching it from there. What, what is your take at this point? My first take is I'm happy I didn't spend an entire day in a lockup for this. Um, and my sympathy goes to my colleagues for having done so. I agree that it's about winning an election more than about setting a, a course or a different course. It's half a platform and at best half a, a, a federal budget. And on that score, they're going to be running against the clock to show Canadians, to show voters actual results on many of those fronts because it's one thing to say it and it's another thing to implement it. Just think that uh, they just recently finally struck agreements on health care financing with every province or with most provinces mm -hmm. and this is a development stemming from a decision that, that goes back more than a year. So imagine some of the spending in there. There are choices, though. Uh, the government could have chosen to come in with a smaller deficit. It had more tax revenues than expected. Mm -hmm. It chose to spend all of the extra money on new programs, and that does mean that they will be campaigning on the left and not trying to win back blue liberals, uh, fiscally conservative liberals, uh, in the next election. I still think the opposition, the Conservatives, would have had a better field day if that deficit number had come in way higher yeah, uh, sure. than was forecast last fall. Remember, in the Quebec uh, forecast versus the Quebec budget, the, 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 the projections from last fall turned out to be way off compared to the final number, and that did go a long way to kill 
uh, the, the, the post-budget boost that the government might have been hoping for. Um, all in all, and like uh, my colleagues and like Mr. Blanchet of the Bloc Québécois, I am not packing my bags for a spring election uh, <laughs> because the NDP would pull out of uh, supporting the Liberals on this budget. Okay, that's good. That's good information for me too. Andrew, talk to me about the, the politics more of it here, whether you think that this is what it indicates about who the Liberals are trying to win back here. Well, if you, if you look at the polls, they're trailing now in every demographic and virtually every region. So it's a hard uh, sell for them. But they, the, the ones that they're most likely to get are going to be young people. At least that's their calculation. That those are the least, you know, most recent converts to the other party's causes. Uh, so clearly there's a pretty heavy focus on that. I agree that they're, you know, they're not going to win back fiscally conservative liberals. That, I think that's over and done with. Their only chance, it's not a policy choice I favor, but certainly politically, their only chance is to try to, to round up the NDP vote again, uh, once again saying you must vote liberal, otherwise, otherwise you let in the scary conservatives, but also saying, you know, look look at all the things we're doing that are basically what an NDP government would do. So right. rounding up the left is absolutely the only option available to them right now. The center is gone. 30 seconds to you, Althea, and then a last word from Chantal. Yeah, millennials, Generation Z are definitely the people that they're targeting uh, with all this money, with all the housing efforts. Um, I also think that they want to actually engage the provinces in a fight. There's too much in this budget that is clearly provincial jurisdiction. Even things that they can't really do anything about, like a tenant's bill of right. What is the federal government going to do to support your rights as a tenant? Um, but it's, it's about showing, putting something in the door, saying that you've listened and that you care, but also I think that they are eager to engage on many different fronts in this budget. And then I will say, I think the only way possibly to bring uh, blue liberals back into the fold would be to campaign against the tone of Mr. Poiliev's government and kind of the, the divisive, uh, polarizing politics that they so have tried to whip up anger against. Um, there may be more to mine in that direction, but this budget is not going to help them. Uh, bring those people uh, at all. Last word to you, Chantal. I, I don't think they've given up on blue liberals at all, or even red Tories. And I think they are counting on Pierre Poilievre to drive them uh, holding their nose. The blue liberals and red Tories will be holding their noses whichever way they go. Hmm. But it's, it's still incumbent on uh, Pierre Poilievre to demonstrate to these voters uh, that he has a more serious plan than the liberals. That's very much work in progress. Certainly, yeah. A campaign on the carbon tax is not going to come across as much of a solution uh, to all the issues that Andrew raised early on in the panel. Okay, thank you all very much for your first take. I'll see you all later tonight on The National. Chantal, Althea, and Andrew, thanks, guys. David's been monitoring some of your questions coming into the Ask at CBC uh, email. David? I, I've also just thrown my phone on the floor, oh, Rosie. Great. If you that's heard that noise, that was me were. dropping my phone here on the floor <laughs> of the West Block. Look, we've had a couple of questions about a few things. Uh, and broadly summarized it, there was a lot of emails from seniors wondering why pension benefits in this country, OAS, GIC, Canada Pension Plan, are, are, are not increasing, why they're so low. And it's not really addressed in this. I mean, this was one of the first things the government did very way back in 2015 yes. when it rolled back the increase in the retirement age from 67 to 65. But just to give you a sense of the math, and this is how much the country spends on elderly benefits. By the end of what is being projected here, the government is going to have revenues, they say, in 28-29 of $586 billion. They're going to spend $544 billion on programs. $99.9 billion alone go to elderly benefits. And that's because of the aging population. It's because yeah. of the aging population, because of the rate that they are at. But you're getting into the 20 percent range of 20 cents of every dollar just going straight to elderly right. benefits. Right. So that's one of the challenges there in that increasing that uh, to a point that it makes a difference to people. I'm not suggesting people don't need more money. It yeah. just ripples across the framework, uh, the fiscal framework in such a massive way. Uh, other questions we've had is about what is the government doing on the price of groceries. Um, you remember there was the uh, Affordable Housing and Grocery Act and the only thing they're really hiding from, hi highlighting from the Affordable Housing and Grocery Act is the housing part <laughs> where they're lifting the GST on rental construction but look, essentially what they're doing there is they're continuing with the competition measures that they're targeting the behavior of the grocery stores, focusing on shrinkflation. There 
is the school food program that yes. they say will help people by putting that. Inflation comes down. But broadly, that's yeah. what's happening yeah. is that food inflation now is running below headline inflation. It so is. it's still gone up by about twenty yeah. percent uh, over the last little while, but the rate of it is slowing down, decelerating, and a lot of that okay. is because of changes in the global situation. That's two questions. I'm sure you have a lot more. So you can feel free to send them anyway. I'll probably use them for our show on Sunday. Uh, a final thought from you on whether this budget does what they want it to do. Well, you know, to pick up on all the different groups uh, that that issue was talking about, who this government's trying to appeal to, um, they are underwater with male voters, right? Yeah. People who look like me do not vote liberal and will not vote liberal. Right. That's a sunk cost. There is a gender and generational play here for them. There are, there are a lot of issues that are putting on the table, important to suburban moms in particular, female voters, progressive voters, and younger voters. They have 18 months for these measures to, to gain traction. Uh, in sort of solving the issues that, that people want to address and then connecting with the people they're trying to help. So it's a tall order. We've seen an aggressive rollout plan for the weeks leading up to this budget, which they were praised for, for being strategic and, and, and proactive in their communications. What do they do tomorrow? What do they do the day after? What do they do the day after that? How do they get the workers to build these homes? Yep. And how do they get the municipalities and the provinces to agree to the conditions they put on all the funding? If those things don't work, they're, they're, this will not work for okay. them. David, thank you so much yeah. for that. As David points out, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges certainly for the government right now is that it is running against a clock, the electoral clock, and it has to start showing that some of the things that it has announced today will start to benefit Canadians. And again, we do want to hear from you about whether there's anything in there that will. We have ongoing coverage, of course, here on cbcnews.ca, and David will be back in mere moments on Power and Politics. He'll have an interview with the Finance Minister, Christia Freeland, right off the top of his show. We hope we gave you the information you needed this hour. More still to come. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thanks on behalf of myself and the whole team for our special coverage of Budget 2024. Have a good day.